Welcome back to part two of our process management lecture. My goal here is to tie together a number of lessons we've actually had through the year. I want you to understand why something happens, uh, why something works the way it works, not just be told or have to memorize something. Also, I want to answer the big question, why is my computer taking so long to do something? So process management. Some vocabulary. A process is going to be a program in some stage of execution. Using multi-programming, a computer system has many active processes going on at once, each at various stages of execution. They take turns sharing the CPU. Process management tracking the progress of the processes and managing the share of the CPU. I mean sharing of the CPU. How, how complicated can that be? Well, let's see how this works. Okay, the process cycle. So we've gone through a number of programs line by line by line using assembly language and imagine we start one of those processes now. So we have a brand new process the user starts a program running, it launches Word, it asks for a DVD to play, whatever. Okay, It goes to the ready state and then eventually, eventually the CPU picks it up. Okay, Then imagine it's actually on the CPU. This is when we were running our programs line by line by line in assembler and we were trying to move values around to the register and anyway. What if for some reason, and we'll, trust me just for a few minutes on this, what if for some reason the CPU is taken away from the process, which can happen. It's not done, but the process is interrupted and it's taken away, the CPU is taken away to do something else. Okay, Then it has to go back into the ready state. It might be picked up again by the CPU and then give it up again. The CPU is taken away. But let's say it's not running on the CPU. That would mean, keep in mind now, what we were doing is very accurate in this class. Only one process is running at a time. Well, what if that process, right in the middle of that process, that process needs some information, input out for, from the user, uh, the disk head to move a certain direction, uh, anything. Then the process is just going to sit there and wait. Now all of a sudden, let's imagine the process gets what it finally wants. Now it's back in the ready state. Then it gets and it has to wait because other processes have been running now. Now it's back in the ready state and the CPU picks it up. Oh, but the CPU is needed for something. It's taken away. We're still working on one process. Finally, after a number of runs with the CPU, a number of times taking turns on the CPU, okay, the process terminates execution. This is the process life cycle. I'd like you to be able to explain each one of those steps. So CPU scheduling. The act of determining which process in the ready state should be moved to the running state to take its turn using the CPU. Many processes may be in the ready state. Only one process can be in the running state at one time. So which one gets to move from ready to running? Well, that's a decision for the operating system. What are some options we have? CPU scheduling algorithms. Again, a little vocabulary for us. First come, first served. Processes use the CPU in the order that they arrive in the ready state. Okay. Shortest next job. Ready process with the shortest estimated running time using the CPU next. Okay. And round robin. Each process runs for a specific amount slice of time and then moves from the running state to the ready state to await its next turn if it's not finished. Okay. So how do these work? In order to demonstrate, the best way is to use what's called a Gantt chart. Uh, if you look, many people have heard of a Gantt. Simply put, a Gantt chart is a visual view of tasks scheduled over time. All right, so let's see what one looks like for us. And this is something I need you to be able to do. So first come, first serve. Okay, so imagine these processes. I have five processes. Imagine these processes all hit the ready state at the same time. 
just to make our life a little easier, okay? Next thing I need is these numbers here are the amount of time it needs to use the CPU. So let's say, let's call them milliseconds. So this thing needs 140 milliseconds. This process, whatever it is, only needs 75. Process 3 needs uh, 320 and whatnot. Okay, so how do I do a Gantt chart? If I'm going to demonstrate how the computer uses the first come, first served algorithm, I would begin this way. And your drawings are going to look so much better than mine. Okay, so off we go. So process 1. Process one starts at zero milliseconds and goes 140. Okay. Process two. Process two needs 75 milliseconds, so 140 and 75 is going to get me up to 215. Process three. Process 3 needs 320 milliseconds. Let's see, so on top of the 215, that's going to get me 535. Then the computer's going to try its hand at process 4. Process 4 started at 535 milliseconds. It needs 280, therefore it's going to go up to 815. And whatever that is. Process 5. Process 5 is 815, I said, right? Son of a gun. I don't know what that is, but try to ignore it for a minute if you would. And process 5 is going to take uh, 120 milliseconds, and that I'm at 815 now, so that's going to go up to 940. Okay. So, in other words, is this any good? So, what's that mean? Turnaround time, the amount of time between when a process arrives in the ready state for the first time and when it exits the ready, ready state. So try to imagine this. Process 1 took 140 milliseconds. Process 2 took 215 because it was ready to go here at zero, but it took us this long to get to it because of the first come, first serve algorithm. Process 3 took 535. I know it only took 320, but it had to start and wait for all these others to finish. That's the name of the game of this algorithm. Process 4, 815. Process 5, 940. So in other words, if I had to figure out the average turnaround time, it would be 140 plus 215 plus 535 plus 815 plus 940 divided by 5 is... 529, the average turnaround time. Okay. So first in, first out scheduling. Some things I need you to be able to discuss intelligently about this particular process go like this. Okay. It's a simple scheduling algorithm. Processes are dispatched according to their arrival time on the ready queue. It's non-preemptive. Nobody got stopped. No process got interrupted. Once the process has the processor, the process runs to completion. It's fair. All processes are treated equally. Hey. Some downsides. It's really not fair because long processes make short processes wait. Unimportant processes make really important processes wait. It's not useful at all in a scheduling interactive process because it cannot guarantee short response times. Imagine you're playing an online game with 10 other people. One person would dominate until they're done and then it would turn its attention to the next person. Now you all want to be playing at the same time. It's important that you know it. It's simple but it's rarely used as a master scheme. But many scheduling schemes dispatch processes according to priority. So, but Processes with the same priority are dispatched in a first-in, first-out manner. So it may be some processes are ahead, but you could have three processes all the same priority. They'll work by first-in, first-out. Another type of process I need you to be able to tell me about is the shortest time. Shortest time is pretty obvious. I'm just going to grab 
whichever process will take the shortest amount of time. And so the shortest amount of time, let's see, I'm going to take process 2, starts at 0, and goes to 75. Next shortest looks like it'll be process 5. So process 5 needs 125 and 75, so it's going to get me up to 200. Process 1 looks like the next one at 140, so 200 and 140 is going to get me 340. Process 4 looks like the next shortest one, so process 4 needs 280. I'm at 340, so that brings me up to 620. And process five, or process three is the only one I didn't finish. Oh, that's a really long one, yeah. So that's going to wait till the very, very end. That took 320 milliseconds. That's what it needed. It started 620, and so that brings us up to 940. I hope that wasn't a really, you know, important process because it has had a wait until the shortest job was taken. So in other words, for this particular, if I had to calculate the average response time, let's see, that'd be 75 plus 200 plus 340 plus 620 plus 940, divide that all by 5, and it looks like and it looks like my average, my at 940, I don't even care what that is right now. My average response time is going to be 435 milliseconds, which if you'll notice is better than first in, first out. Let's talk about that. So shortest process, first schedule is a non-preemptive scheduling discipline, nobody got interrupted, in which the scheduler selects the waiting process with the shortest estimated runtime to completion. Sounds great. It reduces the average waiting time over first in, first out. It actually did better with the same processes in the time. The waiting times are more predictable than first out, first in, first in, first out rather. The biggest problem is with the shortest process first is that it requires precise knowledge of how long a process will run, and we really usually don't know that. Shortest process first, like first in, first out, is a non-preemptive and thus not suitable for environments in which the reasonable response times have to be guaranteed. How are we going to sell a game if nobody, nobody, if people are waiting for their turn? So round robin. For round robin, what we have is everybody's going to get a turn. Round robin is the amount of time a process is allowed to use the CPU before being preempted. Oh, we haven't seen that yet. Before being preemptive and returned to the ready state to allow another process its turn at the CPU. Okay. So let's try this. And hopefully I don't get that little glitch in my Okay, round robin. And I need, actually, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. Whoops, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. I'll need a little bit of room to write this. seconds rather. Remember, we're doing round robin CPU and according to this, what is the average turnaround time using round robin? Assume the time slice is 50. So every process is going to run. We're going to look at every process, but they only get 50 milliseconds. Then we go on to process two. 
process two, we're going to give that 50 milliseconds. 50 and 50 is going to get me 100. Now, that doesn't mean either one of those processes are done, but we're moving on now. Round robin. We're moving on to process three. Process three needs another 50, and so we're going to give it rather another 50, so that brings us up to 150. Off we go. Process four. Process four needs 50, or gets 50 rather, and so now we're at 200. And that's process five. Process five, another 50 for process five. And that brings me up to 250. At which point we go around again to process one, round robin. Round robin gets in, or rather process one gets another 50, and so that's going to bring us up to 300. And now we get to the important part of round robin. Now I'm going to go to process two. Process two only needed 75 milliseconds. So we don't need to give it the whole 50. We only need to give it 25 more. So 300 plus 25, I'm here at 325. I'm going to circle that because that's the end of process two. 325. There we go. All right. After process two, we're going to go to process three. After process two, we're going to go to process three. I'm going to try this one more time, and then I may have to interrupt this to try to deal with this thing, but here we go one more time. Process three. Process three is going to get me 50 more milliseconds, but I'm at 325, and that's going to get me up to 375, but still process three isn't done yet. We're going to move on to process four. Process four gets another 50. Let's see, how much have I spent on process four so time? Just 50 so far, so that's 50, and that's going to get me 425. I'm moving on from there to process five. Process five, oh wait, have I been, oh, I've only put 50 into process five so far, so that brings me up to 475. Now my next drawing, I'm gonna start here at the next level. I'm just gonna make a little note that I'm starting here at 475. So 475, I just finished process 5, so now I'm going on to process, oh, oh, the other thing, here we go, um, process at 325, I got to keep track, process 2 was done, I went to process 3, process 4, I'm back to process 1 again, and process 1, needed 400, 140 rather, and I spent 50 on it so far, another 50 on it so far, so process one only needs another 40 milliseconds, so that brings me up to 40 and 475 is going to get me 515, and that's the end of process one. After process one, I go to process two, but wait, Process two is already done. It finished at 325. So I'm on to process three. And if you can do that, I think you can get through this round robin. Gant. Let's see. Process three, uh, process three, 320. Nope, I need another 50 on that. So that's going to get me 560. Process four. Process four, I need another 50 on that. Oh, 65 rather, 565. So another 50 on that, that's gonna bring me up to 615. Process five, I'm gonna spend another 50 milliseconds on that. 
But let's see. Uh, process five, I needed, let's see, I got 50 here and 50 here and another 50, but I don't need another 50. I only need 25. So 25 and 615 is going to get me 640. And that's the end of process five. So I go to process one. Wait, I'm done with process one. I go to process two. Wait, I'm done with process two. So I'm on my way to process three. Process three, I spend another 50 on that. That's going to get me 690. Process four, I'm going to spend another. Oh, process four. Process four, I'm going to spend another 50 on that. That's going to get me 740. Process three, I'm going to spend another 50 on that. That's going to get me 790. Process four, going to get me another 50. That's going to get me up to 840. Process three, that's going to get me another 50 on that. That's going to get me 890. Process, I'm going to cheat a little bit just so I can make the last of this. So process four, let's see, so far I've spent uh, 50 and 100 and 150 and 200 and 250. I only need, uh, let's see, 280, 250. I only need 30 more. So 30 more plus the 890 is going to get me 920, and that's the end of process four. And so my last step is going to get me process five. Your drawings are going to look so much better. And let's see, process five, how much time did I spend on that? 50, 100, 150, Two process five or process three rather process three excuse me right here process three process three I only needed another twenty to go and so that brings me to a grand total of nine hundred and forty and that's the fifth number that I need and so how am I going to figure out the average rate for round robin? Let's see. Uh, process, so 320. So 3, 325 plus 515 plus the 640 plus the 920. 20, 20, plus the 940, add those all together, divide by 5, that gets me a grand total of 6, 668, well, that's the worst one yet, and that was being as fair as I could with all of these processes, so round robin scheduling. Processes are dispatched first in, first out, but given a limited amount of processor time called a time slice or quantum. If a process does not complete before its quantum expires, the system preempts it, first time we've seen that, that's important, and gives the processor to the next waiting processor. <coughs> and places the preemptive process at the back of the ready queue. It's very effective for interactive environments in which the system needs to guarantee reasonable response times. <clears throat> Commonly found, but rarely a master schedule. Sophisticated scheduling algorithms often degenerate to either first in, first out, or round robin when all the processes have the same priority. A variant of the round robin is called the selfish round robin. <coughs> 
that uses aging to gradually increase process priorities over time. So the longer it waits, the more chance it has to get the CPU. Determination of the quantum size. Now you can imagine this would be important. Is critical to the effective operation of a computer system with preemptive scheduling. Large or small, fixed or variable, equal size for all processes or determined separately for each. In Linux, the default quantum assigned to a process is 100 milliseconds. Remember, 1,000 milliseconds equals a second. In Windows XP, the default quantum was 20 milliseconds for most systems. Okay. Remember, I told you before, a process could be in the ready queue, it could be running, and then the CPU is taken away from it, but I said I would explain that later. Well, welcome to later. This is one of the many reasons. All these algorithms are one of the many reasons that the CPU may be taken away. But besides round robin, there's other process or algorithms that will take the CPU away from a process. Here's a question that comes up quite often. Quite often, I need you to be able to answer this intelligently. Preemptive scheduling, a scheduling process in which the operating system may take the CPU away from a running process before it is done using it. You need to be able to tell which one of these. Now, these are the only processes you need to know. Which one of these are preemptive and non-preemptive? Think about it for a minute. Okay. First come, first serve. First come, first serve is non-preemptive. Once the process has the CPU, it's not taken away. Shortest job next is non-preemptive. Again, once the CPU is stuck in a process, it's stuck there. However, round robin, the whole idea is it is preemptive process can stop and start and stop and start and you just saw that I think it's important I don't think it makes much sense to study three without mentioning a few others just to compare and contrast I think it makes more sense that way and answers that why question I started this with shortest process first like first in first out is a non preemptive and not suitable for these environments in which a reasonable response time must be guaranteed Two other scheduling algorithms are highest response ratio next, where each process priority is a function not only of its service time, but also of the time spent waiting. If somebody was waiting a long time, we'll let them in. Shortest remaining time, not the shortest time it'll take, but the shortest remaining time in the process, which attempts to increase the throughput by servicing small arriving processes. Deadline scheduling. Certain processes are scheduled to be completed by a specific time or date. How about real-time scheduling? Now we get real. Processes that must execute periodically, such as once a minute, checking on the temperature of a nuclear reactor, or playing a video clip. Any other scheduling algorithm would produce a, would produce a choppy video playback for a nuclear disaster. It has to be real-time scheduling with round robin, maybe first in, first out. Static real-time scheduling algorithms do not adjust process priority over time. All of these had a certain priority. But a dynamic real-time scheduling algorithm will actually schedule processes by adjusting the priorities but using several different algorithms at once. It's a wonder this stuff is complicated. So process management, finally. Process management is going to be, we're going to need what's called the process control block. It's used by the OS to store information about processes that are not currently being used by the CPU. The CPCB, the process control block, includes current values of all CPU registers for the process, including the program counter, oh wait, this sounds familiar, general purpose registers like R and the CCR bits, accounting information. Why does the OS need to store all these register values? Well, let me show you this first. Does this look familiar? Imagine we were working through this step by step, this lousy little seven line program 
and right in the middle, while we were juggling all this stuff, the bell rang and we have to pick it up where we left off the next day. Not start again, but pick it up exactly where we left off. Now imagine this isn't a seven line program, it's a 10,000 line program. And it's gonna be stopped and started several times. And we can't start it fresh. We have to pick it up from where we left off. So, for processes that have the CPU taken away, you need these values so that their execution can resume exactly where it left off the next time the process gets run on the CPU. So with all those scheduling algorithms, every time one of these processes, a hundred different processes running once, every time one of them gets taken away from the CPU, we have to store all this information, like a snapshot of all this information, so we can revisit this process again in a few milliseconds and pick it up exactly where we left off. So finally, process management. There is only one CPU, let that go for a minute, and therefore, only one set of CPU registers, which contain the values for the currently executing processes. Each time a new process is moved to the running state, register values for the currently running process are copied to the process control block. Register values of the new processes moving into the running state are copied from the processor control block into the central processing unit. And this exchange of register information is called the context switch. So all of this information has to be moved back and forth. And this is just one process out of 100. And this is frozen in the middle. We've got to remember where to pick it up. And just to make the whole idea really incredible, what if we were using, oh, I don't know, a processor that actually didn't have one core? That's just to make the discussion easier. What if it had eight core? And so in other words, we could have eight of these processes running, eight of these processes running, and every time any one of those processes was interrupted by another process, we'd have to take all this information and store it somewhere. <sighs> Very complicated topic. Keep an eye out, accompanying this will be a sheet where I'll need you to demonstrate uh, some information, the vocabulary, and especially the Gantt diagrams. And here endeth the lesson.